Welcome to our Meet the AAC panel here at DEF CON. All right. Uh, my name is Ryan Black. I'm the Senior Director of Security Operations at Bookrail. Uh, I oversee the team responsible for the validation and triage of our findings uh, on our platform. And uh, as many of you know, running a bug bounty can be a challenge. Uh, you can receive you know, hundreds of violations uh, a week, varying criticality, varying validity, and that can be uh, very tough to manage. And uh, organizations hardly have the time to, to manage those things. And that's why that's why Bugcrowd's Bug Crowd's here. So um, you know, we at Bugcrowd have remained committed to uh, uh, committed to you know providing that full scale management here since day one, since we were founded. And uh, that's a big part of that's this team here. So uh, you know, on our platform, we also provide the full scale support the operations team that's behind that, facilitating the management of the research communications and the back of the, setting up the brief and all those things for the, for the bug down. Um, so we've got uh, a bit of our uh, security operations team here. I also have some throughout the audience. So hey guys. Uh, so we have a couple questions here. We, have a couple questions here we want to take questions from you all as well. And have to take, stay here, take some time to meet with you all, talk with you, talk about how we do our jobs and how we fit in and how we can help you. Alright, so without further ado, I can introduce our panelists. Hi guys. Um, so I'm Sven, my name is Sven, uh, on the platform I'm Sven K, K is for my last name. Um, I'm the program manager at Buckcrowd, um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, currently uh, doing a master's degree in software engineering, also I like to play games. That's it. <laughs> I like James. So I'm Sean, uh, I'm the technical training manager at uh, Buckcrowd, I handle a lot of the Training and as well as the quality assurance aspects of our of our work, um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I'm Ashley. I'm one of the ASCs, so I'm helping triage all your subs. Hi, I'm Trim. Uh, I'm an ASC at Buckcrowd, and I, I do the same like triaging and validation box. Great, great, great. So, how did you get started in the cybersecurity? So, um, that's an uh, it started quite a bit ago. Um, so I like to play games, I still play a lot of games, but uh, so back in the day you would buy uh, games that came with a CD, but you can only play when the CD is in there. So, so <laughs> I was looking online how you can play without a CD in it, so, and there were, so they were called cracks back there. So um, yeah, so I found some cracks, I played some games, but some of them didn't have cracks. So I would start be interested in like, how do you make your own crack? And it starts like, oh yeah, you have to reverse engineer the binary. And then uh, I was just on shady forums reading everything I can. And I found this interesting list that starts like, if you want to be a hacker, you have to do this, 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 this. And it starts with like a thousand page book about TCP IP, just that. So I started reading that book. And by the time I was done, like I was doing totally something else. But that's what got me into security. Learn about binary stuff, then move to web, and then back to binary. Like many people here, I think. Yeah. Experimenting. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just experimenting. Found a way into it. Uh, and yeah, it's fun. Cool. How about you, Sean? Uh, so when I was younger, I used to dabble. Same thing with Sven, with video games and stuff like that. You know, you usually get like a share a version of a game that was actually technically the whole game, but it would have a timer or something like that. So I would just try to figure out how to shut the timer off so I just keep playing the game indefinitely. Um, I didn't get into it professionally until much later, about my mid-20s, I would say. Uh, I started out at White Hat Security and went into the web, web aspect of it and down here at Bug Crowd. Um, my story is pretty similar. I also started at White Hat Security. I, it was my first tech job. I just kind of landed into it from sheer dumb luck, to be honest. Um, and I started learning, and I fell in love with it. Now I'm here. Oh, true. So I, I, I guess we uh, all share the same, uh, you have uh, very similarities with how we started. Like I was a gamer as, as well. And since I was a kid, I, I like to play games, a lot of them. But uh, at some point you get bored of them. So you try to uh, hack them or do, uh, make them work the way you want it or just go to places like you're limited or you can't go. And I, I still remember I started uh, doing maps for a uh, Counter-Strike game yeah. and uh, I visualized a map uh, uh, which was a real place in my, own, uh, in my town and it got like uh, 100,000 uh, downloads. It was very famous, popular. So uh, from there I started like doing also development 
but was always focused on security because this this like uh, I like this uh, the the puzzle way of doing security like you never know how it works behind until you start uh, digging around and see how things work and changing them again so I'm here. Yeah. My first experience with the debugger was making a trainer for The Sims. <laughs> so, free some um, Yeah, so, um, Spin, you are our technical services manager on the team. Could you tell everybody a little bit more about how that role fits into what we do? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm a program manager at uh, Bob Crowd. I started off as an ASC, just like, uh, like uh, them. And just triaging bugs, but then um, you know, as we as we grew more, we had more programs. We had to start, you know, dividing who's working on which programs. You know, we started making primary ASCs on on each of the programs, and that's that's so. Since I started really early, that's sort of I sort of started taking over that part, and um, so that's that's a big part of my role is just making sure we have a primary person on each program that really knows the program very well, knows the customer and the workflow. And um, besides that, I just make sure that you know we work off our queues. If there's like any uh, fire or escalation on a, pro uh, on a submission, I, I look into it, uh, see what's the deal, you know. Try to guide the ASCs. If they have any questions, they can come to me anytime. Because I've been, I've been with Bob Crowd since four years, so um, I've really seen it scale. And I know I have a lot of the answers, um, I hope. Yeah. Um, for them, and yeah, do do a little bit of reporting and yeah, a little bit of everything else. Yeah. That balance is important too, because programs can start off quite busy, that going and changes when targets are added, things like that, and our team responds to that to make sure we're on top of things with our response time. Uh, as far as critical issues, we're under 24 hours on those, actually. And um, for everything else, just a hair over. So that's very important, both for the researchers to see that they all that work they've done, someone's looking at it, making sure they're getting that responsiveness, and obviously for the programmers that are running these two these issues. Uh, Sean, you're our technical training and QA manager. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain a little more how that fits into the rest of the case? Um, yeah, so when I first started, we didn't really have documentation for anything, so I just kind of started plinking away at you know, writing up everything, making sure that we had policies in place for a lot of the work that the operations team is doing. Um, and then to just kind of piggyback on top of that, I started doing quality assurance, which is I started monitoring the work, making sure that we're consistent in all areas uh, of our job, um, as well as just you know, making sure that everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing and when they're supposed to be doing it. Um, and yeah, and then also I still run a few programs too for some of our clients, so yeah. That support's really important too. I mean, how many researchers do we have in here? No. Fair, fair amount's good. Glad you guys are here. Um, you know, when you open a, a support ticket, we've got several people inside of operations that help out with that. We've got our support team, but also the folks here in our team. We care a lot, many of us are members. And uh, when you have a question, we want to make sure something's understood, something's prioritized correctly, facilitating that for the customer. That's one piece of that is the working. Thank you, Sean. And actually, um, and, you know, as an ASC, beyond the validation and triage report, which is very important, you do much more than that. Uh, could you tell everyone a little more about that? Um, yeah, so all the ASCs, we do a lot of like intermediary work between researchers and clients. So we're helping translate researcher to client and back and forth. Um, we also all help work on the VRT, so helping to set the standard for what your bugs are going to be worth and just giving clients also a pretty good expectation of where they should be seeing the different types of bugs, even if they don't know much about security themselves. Yeah, and how many uh, of you are familiar with the vulnerability rating tax on the bug crowd? Yeah. Uh, it, it's open source, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, if you're working on a platform, you'll see that. We use that to classify the issues, help inform a baseline priority as a recommendation, of course. We work with the customers on uh, and our program writers on that. But if you see that, and you have, if you have opinions, and you have some feedback, uh, again, open source, go to GitHub, give us that. We care very much about your opinion on this. It's very important. Yeah, and just to emphasize, every time you guys do make a comment on the VRT and GitHub, we talk about it every week. Yep. Your comments are not ignored. They're definitely seen. Even if the discussion's internal, all of your input does get taken seriously, and we all discuss it thoroughly. Right. We have a standing meeting every week on this and add on as we have things coming in, so it's very, very important to team. But you try. Yeah. yeah uh, besides the VRT, which is very important, uh, we, we are included also uh, in uh, doing support tools for our team. So. Many times we we use to develop uh, small tools, but which which are helpful uh, for our job and doing it uh, validation and triaging better and faster. So, yeah. And, and so 
Um, you know, many of us have different interests and, and <coughs> different backgrounds throughout security, right? Former researchers, pen testers, enterprise security. Um, and as far as your your um, uh, sort of favorite or, or vulnerabilities you might specialize in, what, what are yours? So, <coughs> so like I said, I started off with binary. So I read a lot about buffer overflows. Back in the day, it was a little bit easier because there was no uh, execution prevention or SLR and all that stuff. Um, then I got sucked into web because you know web was booming, uh, so web is really fun. But now I'm with with IoT, it's, it's a little bit going back to binary. Um, I like to debug applications, you know, try to find more abilities. Um, I think yeah, yeah, that's my favorite. Um, web has kind of grown old on me, so I've I've just seen so many submissions, vulnerabilities. I mean, there's there's still always cool stuff coming in, where it's like, wow, how how did that happen? Yeah. But uh, but yeah, the, the binary stuff right now is, is more interesting to me, and, and I'd like to focus more on that. And my two, they fine. Yep. How about you, Sean? Uh, I got my start, my professional start, I got web app security, and that I'm with Sven. You kind of see everything after a while. Um, I mean, every once in a while, we'll see something crazy, but I like to focus on a lot of the device, device based programs. Those are, my, I think, my favorite right now. Um, similar, um, I work on a lot of the actual device programs that we have at Bug Crowd, and it's really interesting to see how people misuse those things. So that's probably my favorite right now. Yeah, so I, I used to be a developer and uh, did a lot of stuff in mostly in web, and, but uh, also for uh, mobile applications or things like that. So uh, I would say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing good in, the, in web and in, mostly in APIs. Uh, but I'm pushing forward also in uh, binary yeah. because I just enjoy it. Yeah, that's my, that's my favorite. Though. I mean, so as you've heard on, on the team, we have different things. As many of you probably have something that really piques your interest a lot. We lean on each other's strengths. So we use Slack. Uh, we're in Zoom talking to each other face to face. If somebody sees something where they have a question, we work together a lot to understand it, make sure we help the customer understand it, work with our researchers, and help them form the priorities. It's really important that we lean on each other, on each other a lot for that. Um, so, Sven, what's been your experience sort of facilitating that engagement between the researchers and the, the customers? Um, so, my experience is um, I feel like sometimes it works out really well um, when, when both parties communicate with each other. Um, that's, that's the best when, when that works out because you, you, it's not that you don't have to do much work, but that's also like a good benefit of it. But it just like happens naturally, and ideally, that's that's how it would happen. Ideally, we'd have just you know hackers talking to to companies, telling them, hey, here's a vulnerability. Yeah. Um, so I like that experience a lot. Um, what's not so good is if when either party is not responsive, um, then then it's it's on us to make sure you know we we follow up and uh, make sure we contact that person. And that's that's sort of the uh, that's that's why we are here right. basically. It's because we you know we, we facilitate um, the communication between both parties. We just make sure that they uh, they work together as best as they can. Right. And you know back like if you if you look at the history, um, fulldisclosure.org. Um, that's that's the not so good experience. Yeah. So um, I'm I'm happy that you know we're here and, and we're we're playing this this middle ground. So both researchers and customer trust us. And um, that's so we're we're kind of a, a bridge between them, and that's uh, that's a really good experience. Just you know, being this bridge, right. and, and making two two parties that maybe don't like each other that much like them more. Right, that arbitrage is really important, and yeah. that trust that the, the customers have in us, that the researchers have in us, to do the right thing for everybody, to facilitate that mutual success is really important. Sean, what's your perspective on that? Um, I mean, I really like it when uh, I help a. Uh, you know, like a new, newer researcher, uh, surprise a client. That's probably one of my favorite interactions uh, when handling with submissions and stuff like that. Because, um, you know, some clients, whatever, don't think that, you know, the program might not find anything, something like that. And I really love it when a researcher reports something and it just blows their mind. You know, they didn't think that that was possible. Yeah. And I like being able to help communicate and foster a relationship between the two of them. So that, you know, if they do end up submitting more, more and more in the future, um, you know, yeah. be a good relationship. Help, help, help them understand as well. Mm -hmm. it's helping us, but also the researcher understand the back of architecture, how to test effectively, what's the intentional functionality, what's not. That's very, very important to have that discussion back and forth openly. The best with what Sean was just saying is sometimes 
it's really rare, but you'll see a client put an internal note and be like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> and that's it. That's all they put. And it's like, okay, we just blew our minds. So it just happened. Yeah. And we actually meet weekly um, to look over notable findings, by the way. It's an edu educational opportunity for us. Uh, it's, it's very good, but we see a number of things like that where we have the same reaction. To it. I, had, I, I remember one submission that came in, it was really critical, and the only like internal note from the customer was like, crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, for example, I can just mention uh, one submission which was lately. Uh, the researcher like reported something which he wasn't aware that it was very critical, and he reported like uh, uh, a P5, we call it, in VRT, who is familiar with that. So, uh, after reviewing it uh, together with the client, uh, it turns out that it is uh, very critical and uh, it's a P1. And the client uh, responded to that very uh, quickly, fixed it. So, we, we try to uh, facilitate this communication with, yeah. between researchers and clients. Because a lot of time, researchers will also put the wrong VRT yeah. entry or just the wrong priority on something like oh it's like a p4 like we're gonna we're gonna go through that and we're gonna fix it we're gonna try to make sure you get that p1 that p2 um fix the vrt entry for you and talk you through how to use it um that's a big part of our job as well is making sure everyone gets the best value clients and researchers definitely um so talking about some of the submissions we've seen with respect to what we can discuss here uh, what's been some of your favorite things you've seen come through? Yeah, so my favorite is one of it's it's an older submission, but we had uh, we had one client that um, had a point of sale tablet, and um, but, so we shipped it out to some of the researchers and they tested it. And uh, one of the guys found it very interesting. But Sean actually triaged this, but I, I just like this. <laughs> I tell everybody about it. It's, uh, so it, the the point of sale has just like it just has a login. And the, uh, the challenge was you know, to try to bypass that login or try to install something on the tablet. And um, so one of the researchers, um, I don't know how he was able to reverse engineer the app, but he basically found out that if you, like this, there's just a login here, but like if you tap in this space where there's nothing, like very fast, it will show an admin login, and you can just log in with admin admin or something similar, and you get full access to the tablet. Yeah. So that's that was really those crap moments. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> one of those crap moments. Yeah, exactly. code, weird stuff. That's that's yeah, yeah, this fascinates me. Um, that's, that's the best submission I've seen. How about you, Sean? So we had a device-based program, and uh, unfortunately, the uh, micro SD card slot got damaged, shipping it from the client to us. Um, and so, but there was a few submissions that ended up. Uh, requiring you to have a micro SD card, and unfortunately, whenever we put one in there, it would get bent in half, um, which became a problem. We tried that more than once, right? Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. I ruined about three, three, three micro SD cards on that one. Uh, so, what we ended up having to do is uh, get a reverse shell on the device to uh, make the device think that it had a micro SD card into it. And I thought that was, that was pretty fun. Yeah. Learned a lot in that one. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> Did you know that if I have complete access to your email address, I can reset your password. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zero day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have our team meetings. Ash has got a lot of those good things. We see a lot of that. Yeah, I can, uh, I can mention one. So uh, I, I just want to point out that how, how easy it is to uh, sometimes uh, there are uh, bugs there like uh, which have big impact and that they are uh, easy to do. And like Spen mentioned, by clicking, uh, I, I just have seen one, for example, you change the ID of your bank details you were saved earlier. Uh, so you used an, another ID, which is incremental uh, number, and you used an, uh, an ID that turns out to be to another account, and you can make payments <laughs> with the other... With uh, their bank account? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Simple so so IDOR are really, really bad at that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. IDOR on the bank account transfer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, developers yeah. make mistakes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, That's so, a bad mistake. <laughs> <laughs> How do I get... Which yeah. bank is that? I want to pay <laughs> So, uh, and we've got some time, of course, for questions here, but a couple of things, uh, since we have everyone here, um, it's just advice. For, for researchers, actually. So, what's your your best advice for the researchers? 
Be nice to me. <laughs> like we're always gonna fight our best for you, but when you're mean to us or condescending or asking us for an update every 20 minutes a second after you send in your report, it makes it harder for us to do our job. Yeah, that's true. We, we are there to help. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm I'm gonna add to that. Just think about when you write a submission. I just think that the the first person that's gonna see it is bug crowd, not the the people that wrote the app. So I found myself many times looking at the refer or just trying to find that post request oh, yeah. uh, where the idler is in. So um, yeah, when you write up a submission, just think that. Uh, you're writing it for somebody that has never used the app, not for somebody that wrote the app, uh, because there's a big difference. So uh, most of us, you know, don't know all the features of the application. So uh, it's, it it takes us time to find a post request that has an idler in it or or the field. Like we get stored XSS where yeah, here's where it fires, but like how do you get it there? Yeah. Um, so yeah, just just think about that part. And we, we do the same, like when we, when we patch up submissions to send to the client, that's how we write them. So as verbose as possible yeah. um, is, is really helpful for us. And yeah, videos are not always helpful. Yeah. <laughs> but we really good music. Awesome. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes. The better the music, yeah. the, the better we're Can you get <laughs> music on it, please? Yeah, videos, videos are good. Um, but the video also has to have every step. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's that's the point. I mean, like you know, we're, we're technical. We try. We work with each other to help understand these. So we have various expertise and specialty. Um, you know, help us out though. We use those apps, but it's very beneficial for us to be more verbose. Help us this faster acceptance for you, more clear impact for us to convey to the customer, and advocate for you actually to see things accepted, be appropriate priority, help them get that fixed. That's the ultimate um, ultimate point. Yeah, so if it's on the profile page, tell us authenticate. Yeah. Click in the top right hand corner, look for this icon, go down to profile, click save. Yeah. Like that'll yeah. that'll take off a good couple minutes of trying to figure out how to do just that one stuff. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, you don't have to like also be much uh, putting every tiny detail in there. For example, just going a hundred pages long report, but uh, most, the most important thing is, I guess, the reproduce, uh, reproducing steps to be clear. So we, when we follow them, uh, we, we can actually reproduce the exact uh, issue that you were reporting. So uh, besides this, I also uh, would say just uh, stick to the uh, brief and the scope of the program. Yeah, and ask. Yeah. You're, and, you're not sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Always free to ask support. Ask in the submission if you'd like to go further, help us demonstrate, basically work with us, over communicate. <coughs> cool, so for, for customers, uh, likewise, uh, our, our program owners, what's their best advice? Transparency. Yeah. Try to, I mean, so there's certain things you can't really tell them, you know, or at least there's internal things, you know, and stuff like that. But um, as a client, you should be transparent with them and you should you really need to, like, if you close something out, you're not going to fix it. Let them know and at least explain why, at least give a reasoning, you know, just so you can keep a dialogue kind of going on with it. Don't just close it out and be like, you know, that's it. That's and it. silent. Yeah. yeah. Even if it's a generic reason. It doesn't yeah. have to be yeah. like a paragraph long telling them everything about your development process, but just yeah. saying, we don't feel this is a large <coughs> impact for X, Y, Z, and then close it. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay to talk to the researchers. You can talk directly to them. If, you, if you'd like, give us the context as well. We can help message that. Yeah. But again, air on transparency. All three parties are there to be successful. Mm -hmm. And fix bugs. Yep. I would think it, it would be very helpful if they also uh, think uh, and uh, before they uh, start the program and just uh, add uh, the expectations uh, like exclusions uh, in the in their brief they, they define the scope very well and so we, we won't have any issues after that so uh, the researchers report different kind of stuff that's what I said earlier just uh, it would be better for both parties to uh, define a good brief and scope and uh, the researchers stick to that. So. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean, if things evolve, if you launch the bounty, you make some observations, you'd like to optimize some things, if you'd like to, to make those changes, work with your your uh, your CSM on, on, and, and work with us. Let us help you turn your bounty goals into a really good brief. So it's okay to change those things, yeah. but update update the brief as soon as you make 
different decisions and you have some things to tweak, the sooner you have that transparency on the researchers, the better you can you know, drive how they're testing, setting their expectations exactly. before the submission. So we want to get it right, get a very strong refit at the launch with Audi, for example. We think we do a good job on that. Uh, but that's something that we want to continue to work with our customers on to make sure that it's very accurate for that purpose. Yeah, I was, I'm just going to add, like, work with us is really important. Yeah. Yeah. Because as, as hard as you work on the brief, we all know it's not going to catch everything. Yeah. I'm just playing the bad cop. Uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, ideally, uh, as a customer, you would just see, you know, triage valid vulnerabilities. But the, uh, the real situation is that uh, you have to work with us because um, every application, you know, we, we can talk about the technical severity of a vulnerability, but the business impact is always different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Some subjective quick behavior. example, yeah, quick example is just, you know, your, your application has different roles. Please provide us documentation which role has access to where. Otherwise, you know, we're getting different kinds of IDORs in, and we don't know is that, like, a, yeah. uh, is it supposed functionality, or is this an actual vulnerability? And at the end of the day, you just get more uh, like so, so if that is not documented very well, um, you get those in as valid submissions, and then you say, "Oh, well, this works out. This works as expected, yep. and the researchers wasted time, and Buckrat has wasted time, yeah. just because of lack of information." Right. So, so, I mean, to your point on that, I mean, the more you can give us that information, we take notes. We don't want to ask the same question twice. Yeah. A big benefit of what we, we do is to insulate and take those things in. Let the security teams of our customers <coughs> focus on fixing issues, and getting those to the right teams internally, having the context working with us, we can help provide where we can that uh, the impact and that scope. But just again, air transparency, let us take some notes. Existing documentation is great. Anything you can do to let us do a great job um, for the researchers to have that on the channel and the customers. Um, and so we want to save some time. We've got a lot of great folks in here. Just to open it up for questions and see how we can uh, answer this. Spend some time meeting. Any questions? Sure, go ahead. Are there any, um, what's like sort of an emerging, emerging trend that you've seen over the past six months that you've heard of submissions that you guys are getting? Uh, so the question was, what was the uh, emerging trends yeah. of uh, things we've been seeing? Um, I think um, a couple of different themes, right? Uh, researchers are really, and I love this, you know, sharing information with each other and yeah. how the testing methodology, different tools come out. And so oftentimes some of those things come out are Jason, who we've got with us here, Jason Hanks. Um, Woo! Yeah. Woo. Uh, you know, releases some, some new information about guiding discovery and how to test. I mean, when that stuff comes out, researchers generally take advantage of that new knowledge and share it with others. And so as far as like, a theme, we'll see uh, you know, certain testing methodologies there that we We'll see recurring. That's healthy. I mean, you know, to show that knowledge and let us see that. Um, as far as you know, to kind of pivot off that, like what type of bounties, uh, you know, it's, it's growing. Automotive, IoT, you know, routers, cameras, consumer devices. And so as those bounties uh, are launched and those companies continue to, to grow that, and uh, we support it, we see more of those types of submissions. Yeah, and to kind of piggyback on that, I've seen a lot more researchers talking openly on Discord, on Reddit, on mm -hmm. Twitter. Yeah. Uh, probably when I first started in bounties about two and a half years ago, people weren't sharing as much. And now we're seeing a lot of the, I guess, higher points or higher in the leaderboard type of researchers taking other ones under their wings and being like, here's how you do this. I wrote out an entire like, blog post on how to test this exact thing for noobs. Come check this out if you have questions. Hit me up on Twitter. That's not something I saw before. Yeah. So it's a lot more, the community in the researchers themselves are getting less hostile to each other and are realizing the more we all work together, the better we're all going to do. Yeah, and ultimately we're customers of a lot of these apps anyway, so researcher, but also you want your AI safe, so. Yeah. I'm just going to add, so what I saw the last six months to a year is that we get a lot of new researchers that like come in and write just professional uh, submissions. So I think a lot of pen testers are starting to do bug bounties, which is really good because they do an awesome job. Um, in just you know writing a submission from start to finish, like they're they're used to writing it for a pen test report, and they do the same. That's yeah. that's really good. So we see a lot of researchers just coming in and crushing it right away. Yeah, use the um, markdown, make it really clear. Yes, code blocks, anything <laughs> like that. Very helpful. And but contrary to that, you also see some of the researchers you know that started a year ago, and they were just reporting like low quality issues. Sometimes you have to explain why something is not an issue. And then you look at them now, you know, they're getting $1,000 in rewards. They're writing a submission 
very clearly and, and you know it's, so it happens like I change the title of a submission and you know the next submission that comes in from that researcher has a perfect title so like they learn it uh, and, and it's, it's really good to see research you know starting here but then after a year they're like really high and really good and yeah, it, I, it makes me feel good to see just researchers, you know, progress. making good yeah. progress yeah. and, and just becoming just launched the Buckshot University, actually. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So as yeah. far as you know, testing and helping to guide that, train other people up, some great content that many people on the team have put together, and that's absolutely <laughs> awesome. Get the camera up there. Yes, if I want to start doing blood bond to you and you know, become part of the community, Where's a good place for me to start? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our, our site has an FAQ as far as some resources. There are several uh, you know, platform agnostic slides. There's also Book Crowd University. Just mentioned as far as like how to get started with testing. But where to look, just be curious. Yes, it's absolutely free. You know, so so read that, get involved, meet other people here at the cons that have different areas. Um, you know, you bring your knowledge that you've got from your background, you can share that with others. And uh, then just get started. Be curious. And you'll be shocked at what you might find. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, if you want to do kind of a passive way too, YouTube, just go yeah. how to exploit cross-site scripting and there'll be hundreds of yeah. videos showing you examples, how to do it, resources on what you need to find. Just like, go up down to the OWASP top 10 yeah. and just watch a couple of videos on each and you'll learn a whole lot. The videos from the level up uh, this year in Boston. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah those, those two conferences, many people from the community <coughs> presented at both of those. A lot of great content. It's great to do that and um, really, really good resource for learning. Yeah, yeah. I would I would say the the Web Hackers Handbook is a really good resource. Yeah. I've I've trained a few people. The Web Hackers Handbook. Yeah. Web yeah. Application Hackers Handbook. It's um, the good thing about that book is that you know it has continuity, so it starts off with like the basics of the web and HTTP protocol, and depending how how what how much you know, you can skip those parts. It will tell you, uh, but it starts off at really basic stuff, so you can read that chapter, you know, and then just go online and read stuff. Um, and But if you continue all the way down to the end of that book, you have a pretty good idea of, of most web vulnerabilities. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really good start. Um, it's, it's not something you can just read start to finish and you know everything, but it will give you good tips, which you can then go and Google off and okay. YouTube and, and everywhere and just learn about that. And that hands-on is really important. Just you know, be curious and, and try. So it's fun.